on that note, we're going to do samples. And Jim, this is a pretty fabulous thing, and I think you've had a thousand and nine questions about this beastie. Right. Don't you wish these insects were this big in reality? <laughs> I'm glad they aren't. This is just simply better than showing the actual specimens, so I thought I'd just show a little chart. And these are the metallic kinds of greenish beetles I think that all of you have probably seen in your landscape, except for one, and that would be the emerald ash borer. Now the emerald ash borer is a half inch long and it's something that we're looking out for in the state, but it's still way over in eastern Iowa, eastern Missouri, so uh, we're not too much worried about it right now, but all of you are very diligent in looking for it, its possibility, which is really good. But there are other newcomers that are metallic and shiny green, and that includes this dogbane leaf beetle, which you often find in the fields on dogbane or milkweed very iridescent bluish color, a leaf beetle of no consequence since it feeds on a weed. Uh, but this large green June beetle is one that I think many of you may have seen for the first time. And so we're all startled by it, but it's just a plain, uh, a very large, attractive uh, green June beetle, as its name says. And uh, it tends to come from manure soils. It's spreading across Nebraska. It's not a lawn pest per se but it is kind of a nuisance around the flower garden and the, in the vegetable garden when you have ripe fruits or, or maybe fermenting or decaying fruits and vegetables, it likes to feed on that. So they like to congregate and have a party. And then the last one would be the Japanese beetle that is increasing in numbers across the state. And it's greenish partly, but you can see that it also has a coppery colored, wing, the wing covers are coppery colored. And it, these things will all be around probably well into mid-August, perhaps late August a little bit. But there's something that uh, now that you have been informed about, nothing to worry about, just to, uh, just to know what they are. But remember, emerald ash borer, we do not want it. So if you ever come across something that looks a half inch long, bullet shaped on an ash tree that looks like it's sick, <coughs> emerald ash borer, so let us know. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Thanks, Jim. And those are great pictures. That's good for our viewers. All right, Zach, um, I, I hate to admit it, but that sample came from? Kim Todd's lawn. Yes, it or what she, what she, <laughs> is. Her excuse for a lawn, probably, is a better way of saying it. But this is our, our dear friend, Nimblewill. And Nimblewill is a warm season grass. Uh, it's, one of the, it's one of the rare occasions for warm season grasses. Generally, they're out in the full sun. This guy survives in the, in the shade. And he's a weed because uh, it never forms a very dense turf. It's, uh, it's very wispy. And another reason why it's a weed, it generally doesn't, it doesn't uh, green up until uh, well into May, and then it'll turn uh, brown and go dormant with the, uh, before the first frost. And most people want to get rid of it. Again, it's not, it never forms a dense turf, and so uh, most people want to get rid of it. Uh, one way to get rid of it is Roundup spraying the patches and get, uh, using Roundup probably two or three times during the course of the summer, shortly after it greens up. Or the newer herbicide that we can use now is Tenacity, and Tenacity applied uh, three times over the course of the year will do a really nice job in controlling it. It might take a couple years to get it done. Probably more importantly, if it is in the shade, not, not many other turf species are gonna survive very well in the shade, which I'm guessing it's in the shade in your lawn. You think? I think. <laughs> Nimble Will, our friend Nimble Will. All right, thanks, Zach. All right, Lauren, a mater or I something. I, I brought along a tomato, so a lot of tomatoes <laughs> being produced in backyards right now, so I brought along tomato spotted wilt virus, an example of fruit with that. And you can see in there those nice little rings in the fruit. That's just showing up great. And uh, that's one of the key symptoms that we'll see on the fruit are those little rings that we can see right in there. Uh, so with that, uh, this would also be something that you would have some distorted leaf growth. It may look like a herbicide drift or something like that, but it would be one plant in the patch of tomatoes that you would have that would be affected. Uh, and this is one that, that we definitely want to rogue out. So we get to say rogue out here and, and, and do that again. Uh, it's, it's one that is, is gonna be moved around by thrips, so really difficult to manage. So when you do have that in your garden site, you definitely want to remove it. Thank you, Lauren. Sarah, you went hunting and gathering, I think. I did, I did. <laughs> Didn't bring a sample with me tonight. So this sample comes right here from the Ritz and Gardens. And if you want to take a look at this plant, later on, you just go out these back doors and you'll see this beautiful plant out, out there. This is um, a plant called castor bean. 
And castor bean is really, um, it has some really unique characteristics. It's got these very large leaves, and you can see that um, some of the newer leaves on this variety come in, they're kind of a burgundy color with red veins, and then the older leaves are a more of a medium green with red veins. And then you get these beautiful clusters of seed pods, which are also very, very attractive. Well, I think one uh, real advantage to something like castor bean is it's a very big plant, and it, it gives you a, a large texture and a large, um, almost a coarse texture to the plant, which is something that we sometimes forget to add in our landscapes. You know, we have lots of small, kind of finely textured things, and, and castor bean will come in and give you something really big, a nice focal point. Um, so it's, it's something to think about. Now, there is a drawback to this plant. It is poisonous. The seeds, the seeds are poisonous. So if you're concerned about little children who put things in their mouths, you might not want to have castor bean in your garden. Um, but, you know, it's a very ornamental plant. Lauren and I were talking about this earlier, and he's got some castor beans in his yard. He grows every year that came Actually, from his grandmother. Yeah, I have my great-grandmother's castor beans that I've maintained, so beautiful yeah, plant, yeah. beautiful. So very, very ornamental. Um, just be aware of the caveat that they are poisonous. Excellent, yeah. thanks, Sarah. All right, Jim, you get the first picture of the evening. Um, this is a viewer who lives in East Omaha, noticed a line of caterpillars crawling up the main trunk of a black walnut tree. She washed them off the hose, and then she smothered them with vegetable oil. Oh, boy. <laughs> so she's wondering uh, what they were, and did she do the right thing, or should she have done something differently? Is cooking the next stage? <laughs> You're the entomologist. You're the ones who eat things with well, insects. Well, <laughs> um, I would say that probably was a satisfying move as far as trying to eliminate them. Uh, these are called, of all things, walnut caterpillars. <laughs> and uh, this is the second generation, or actually two generations, but most people don't notice them until the second generation because there's more of them and they're causing more defoliation. They eat together. They like to be together as they eat in the branches. And so you'll have sections that might be completely cleaned up. You know, there's no leaves anymore. But they also have this strange habit of they come down together into the tree and toward the trunk, they mass together and they shed their skins. And then after they shed their skins, they go back up and feed again. Now the last stage is completely different than the brick red striped caterpillar. They're ugly, large, and black with silvery hairs. And you'll see them crawling all over the place. And that's because they're looking for a place to pupate. And then they'll spend the winter in the soil as a pupa. So normally we don't control them because they're only taking out just a portion of a, of a tree or whatever. So they're not really important to control, but if it appears that the numbers are vastly high or something, you can do something like just rake out the masses when they're coming down to the tree, gather them up in a bag and take them away or do whatever you wish. Saute. Saute. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Zach, <laughs> less, less tasty, more problematic perhaps. This is a question from our audience. How do you get ground ivy out of the lawn? Ground ivy out of the lawn. Uh, actually, it's getting to be that time of the year where it's a perfect time to take ground ivy out of the lawn. Uh, well, you could pull it, one thing, and that would be uh, long term. Uh, <laughs> raise the mowing height's always the good one. Cut down the trees because it likes shade. Those are all the good things to do. Uh, but if you do want to resort to herbicides, uh, almost any three-way herbicide applied in September and then again in the middle of September and then again in October will go a long way for controlling this one. Most of us see it in the spring. It's not easy to control in the spring. We'd much rather control it in the fall, like all of our dandelions and plant and then all of our perennial broadleaf weeds. So are we considering this fall? or close? It's getting pretty dang close. I would wait. There's no rush. You have well into October to spray it. And so, again, I would do it twice, about 28 days apart, once in mid-September and once in mid-October, more or less. You'd call it I'd, good. I'd call it good. And again, that's another one that might take a couple of years. Excellent. Thanks, Zach. All right. This is also from our audience, uh, Lauren. This is from Bellevue. How can they get rid of lawn fungus permanently? <laughs> <laughs> he just Permanent. laughs. laughs. Probably the best permanent removal of long fungus would be to just take some clear plastic and put it across your yard <laughs> and maybe cover it. And just let it solarize for the next five years and then you might get rid of it. Yeah. But outside of that, really you're not going to, you're really gonna manage it. So it becomes an issue of, of what your specific problems are. You know, For a lot of our, our, our viewers in Nebraska, we're looking at brown patch 
uh, in fescue lawns. We're looking at dollar spot in, in you know, our, our bluegrass lawns. So, you know, identifying that problem and then trying to, to manage it. So if it's, it's irrigation timing and make sure you're watering in the morning, if, it's, if it does require a fungicide use, um, that could be done just at the specific time. So we really have to get to what that problem is. You know, most likely this time of year, we're talking about brown patch. So okay. then that's looking at, you know, timing, fescue, uh, and Zach wants to key in here. <laughs> you want to weigh in or do you have brown patch? Okay. Well, the, well a, a permanent way to get rid of the, the disease in the lawn is to maintain it uh, better. Just, okay. Or, you know, or, or change out, you know, if you have, if it's, a, if it's an old lawn with old cultivars that are susceptible to summer patch or dollar spot or brown patch, you know, we have a lot of new cultivars that are out there that are much better. And in a lawn, if a disease is a, is a, is a perennial problem, you're managing the lawn wrong. One way is something is wrong, either the mowing height or the fertilizer or the irrigation, something is wrong there. So I'd start first with how you're maintaining the lawn. I don't think you'll get rid of it permanently yeah. unless sure. you, you know, move or put down concrete or whatever. Yeah. Okay, excellent, thanks guys. Sarah, this is also from our audience. A viewer planted a bare root tree a couple of months ago. Uh, still doesn't have any leaves. Is this a former tree? Ah, uh -huh. yeah, that's not a good sign. <laughs> you know, with bare root plants, they come to you and they are just bare stems and bare roots. Um, but then when you plant them, they should leaf out, you know, within a matter of a few weeks. So the fact that this tree hasn't leafed out in all these months, um, either there was some management problems initially when they first put it in the ground, um, or it was a, maybe just bad, a bad uh, plant that came from the mail order catalog. So I think you definitely need to think about replanting that one this fall. And we're getting close to fall. Yeah, although it's, you can't really find bare root material right. in the fall. Fall is an excellent time for tree planting. So if you can find some containerized material or something in a grow bag, you know, that would be a good option. Uh, true or false, actually, from our audience. 50-50. Fuzzier the caterpillar, the harder the winter. Mm. <laughs> It's only an opinion, but I say no. <laughs> Jim says no. All righty then, good. I'm ho I hope there you're not There are some that regardless. look like they, they have their, you know, mink stoles on, really heavy, and you see them in October, November, looking for a place to settle in, but no, not really. They're just more impressive than the, the rest. Okay, <laughs> richer. <laughs> All right, Zach, you get the next picture. Uh, this is a viewer uh, in Geneva who sent us an image of, of this particular creature that they found growing on the property line. Uh, they don't know what it is or how it came to grow there. It looks like it's a, a rather large weed, and I think we figured it out. Yeah, it took us a while. It took us a while to figure that. It's always hard to, uh, to, 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 on the pictures, but we think it's common burdock, and it's a biannual, and the uh, best way to control this, if you want to control it, it would be uh, to cut it down, first of all, or again, any of, the, any of the herbicides, any of the broadleaf herbicides will control it. But it's so big, I imagine there's not very many of them. You could uh, take a weed eater or a, a clippers and take care of that one easier than anything else. All Common right. burdock. Excellent. Thank you, Zach. Lauren, from our audience, and a common question this time of year, how do you prevent blossom end rot in tomatoes? <laughs> So, so blossom end rot, and, and maybe I'll ask Sarah to, to chime in here too on the whole soil <laughs> modification and such. So, um, it, it's not a disease at all. So, it, it's really more, you know, they say, calcium availability to the plant. We tend to see it more, I think, when we have high nitrogen availability to tomatoes. If you put too much nitrogen on, you'll see it. Um, there are products out there that you can you can try. Uh, some of them have shown promise. Uh, I know we talk about liming, Sarah, and modifying soil, uh, but I think really just kind of managing that tomato plant so it's not growing too rapidly is a big part of it. And right. What else would you add? Right. It's usually it's usually kind of a water management issue, and calcium is not very mobile in plants, and so plants have to have a lot of water to be able to move it properly. And so if the plants get too dry, we often see blossom and rot coming in, um, or if the plants are growing too fast, like with the excess nitrogen you mentioned, then oftentimes the available calcium will go to the new developing growing points instead of to the tomatoes themselves. So water management is a big issue with uh, blossom end rot. So we often you know, recommend uh, trying to maintain an even watering schedule, putting down some mulch to try to maintain, again, even soil moisture, um, uh, not doing too much fertilization. Uh, if you have some blossom end rot on the first tomatoes of the season, that's not uncommon. And oftentimes if you pick those off, then your later developing tomatoes will um, avoid that issue. So it's, it's a lot about water and water management as far as getting rid of blossom end rot. 
Thank you. Sarah, we're going to stick with you with a question. This is a hydrangea question. Okay. Um, this particular viewer has a hydrangea about 10 years old, only gets one or two blooms during the summer, gets a lot of sun. She does cut it back each spring to about eight inches. Okay. Any ideas on that one? Okay. Well, the, the pruning could be an issue with hydrangeas because a lot of the older hydrangea cultivars bloom on old wood. So that means the flower buds are formed the year before in the fall. And then if you prune the plant in the spring, you're actually cutting off the flower buds. So what I would suggest for this gardener would be to, um, you, could, you could actually prune right now if the plant were too big and kind of reshape it and then don't prune next spring. And hopefully you'll have flower buds forming later this fall and then it'll bloom, it'll bloom properly for you next year. Um, so usually flower bud uh, pruning is one of the big issues we run into hydran with hydrangeas. With some of the big leaf hydrangeas, we also run into problems with the buds not being winter hardy, and so the buds dying over the winter, and then, you know, you don't get flowers. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking probably since she's doing the pruning and she's pruning it so severely down to eight inches that most likely that's the problem. Well, All right, Jim, right. this is a viewer who wants to know what would be silvering the foliage of a couple of particular plants, shamrock and geranium. Okay, on shamrock, um, it would most likely be spider mites. And uh, remember these two spotted spider mites are a very common pest in the ornamental garden as well as the vegetable garden. This is the time of year when it's hot when they really multiply very quickly and they cause that sudden, it almost seems like sudden damage where you have yellowing or silvering of the foliage. So they're sucking it dry, you might say, with their tiny little mouth parts. So look out for the spider mites. If you don't want to spread this time of year, you can try to pull off those parts that are heavily infested, uh, wash them off very vigorously. That might help if you have insecticidal soaps on hand or if the temperatures are still favorable below 90 degrees, you can apply a horticultural spray oil. But just remember what the label says because all plants might, uh, might work pretty well, but there might be some exceptions. All right, thanks, Jim. Zach, from our audience, this question is whether it is too late to apply Turf Plus 2 to the lawn. The lawn is full of weeds, didn't get anything put down earlier in the season. Uh, yeah, Turf Plus 2 is normally a fertilizer plus a broadleaf herbicide in most cases. And uh, it's really, yes, it's on one hand it's too late, but it's too early. Uh, this Turf Plus 2 really is the best time to apply this. Uh, it's advertised to be applied in, in late April, early May when the dandelions are just about to flower. Best time is just to put that in the garage and wait until 1st of October, end of September, middle of October, something like that. It's way more effective at that time of the year. So it's too late now, but it's too early now. Wait for about a month and a half, two months, and, and fling it then. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. Okay, Lauren, you get a really interesting uh, set of pictures next. This is a viewer there in Frontier County. It's a peach tree planted about 10 years ago. Um, it has had the same issue on hundreds of peaches on this particular tree. It's watered very well and not sprayed with pesticides. The peaches appear healthy and then they do kind of this interesting thing both on the stem end and then the, in the interior. When I think there's a, a picture that shows it split, so yeah, this one coming up. Um, it, the first thing I thought when I looked at this that maybe this was a gym question and it was going to be a cuculio or something like that, but I guess there's nothing inside. Um, and you will have, anytime you get an opening like that, you'll have some soft rots and things move in, so that's, I guess, where it gets to my wheelhouse. But uh, realistically, there's, there's not anything that, that looks like a disease, and I guess some conversations earlier we talked about just that excess water availability and rapid growth, that this is probably a scenario much like we see cat facing or something on tomatoes when we see that splitting in the, in the top portion of the fruit. So uh, it just, in this case where it's a stone fruit, it's starting there at the attachment point and then breaking that fruit open. Uh, so not really anything I would suggest. I mean, if you've got, you know, excess water availability, if it's rain, you can't do anything about it. Um, if it's related to you watering the tree, you may cut that back some actually in this case. All right. So, Thank yeah. you, sir. All right, Sarah, this is also from one of our audience members. Okay. They have a rain barrel. Mm -hmm. The water smells like rotten eggs, sulfur. <laughs> I wonder, is it still safe to use it on the garden? Yes, it is still safe to use on the garden plants. It won't, it won't hurt them at all. 
Um, you probably have some algae buildup in there or possibly some leaves that have fallen in and are decaying and, and that's what's causing the, the smell problem. Um, so it might be good to empty the rain barrel out and, and clean it out. You might use just a little bit of bleach and clean it out really well and then set it back up and hopefully that'll um, minimize that smell problem for you. All right, Jim, you got a, a question here. This is from a viewer in Wahoo. She says she has hundreds of insects crawling the tree. They're ugly. It looks like some of them, they're brown and then they, the back has broken open and they're very loud. Okay, I, I think we're talking about the cicadas. Actually, we call them dog day cicadas or silver-bellied cicadas, the ones that are going you know, incessantly in the, eve, you know, in the evening hours. And uh, what she's actually seeing are the, uh, the, the ones, the life stages that lived in the soil. So for these summer cicadas that we get, they're the greenish ones, they spend about three, maybe five years in the soil. I think it's mostly three years, but there's always some that come up every year. So they live in the soil, they feed on roots of plants, trees, and shrubs, and then they come up like they are now here in August, and they move on to the tree bark, and they attach themselves to the tree bark with their large claws, and then a wonderful thing happens. This lime greenish cicada breaks out through that skin, spreads its wings out, and then it allows itself to dry, and then off it flies to sing so many songs over several day period before life is over for it. But we've had an enjoyable season of cicadas this summer. It's been amazing, the numbers, almost deafening sound. Excellent. Thank no you. control. No control. There you go. All right, Zach, uh, this is a viewer who lives in Buffalo County, has lawn turning yellow. So I think I told you to bring up the buffalo. Well, you said buffalo. I said, I thought buffalo grass. I <laughs> buffalo had some of that too, so <laughs> yes. Came well prepared. Like we have samples, we are sampled up today. So this is, uh, they're in Buffalo County. The lawn is turning yellow. You said you'd had a lot of questions about this. Yeah, right now, uh, right now I'm seeing it all over the state, getting a lot of questions, a lot of emails about this. And this is a phenomenon. Actually, we had it on last week and, and I was very, clear and uh, very confident about the UFOs causing this. Exactly. And I'm now yeah. even, uh, today I'm even more confident it is UFOs. Um, but what you see, and I don't know how close you can get it, this is a, a sample out of Omaha, and uh, uh, the, the grass plants or the grass leaves that are growing uh, most aggressively are turning yellow, whereas the ones that are a little bit older, a little bit slower growing are still down here green. And this is a fairly natural ph phenomenon that we see uh, almost every summer and we see it more often in wet summers than in dry summers and we see this almost 1000 percent on irrigated areas and so it has something to do we're not sure exactly what it is i think it has something to do with uh with the heat of the soil and also saturated soil and uh, some people would call this ateliated tiller syndrome or mad tiller disease there's lots of names for it wow. the bottom line is we really don't know what causes it uh, but on the flip side, it's not going to do any damage if you continue to mow it. Uh, that works. I would probably cut down on irrigation if it's watered. I think this lawn happened to be suggested that it was overwatered. It got too right. much water. Right. So cut down on water. It's probably a compacted state also. Aerification always helps. All right. And, you know, if that were actually a, a garden ornamental and those yellow leaves appeared, people would it's, it, purchase that. Yeah, it's, it's not bad. It's just uh, the, the bad thing. It's just inconsistent. Okay. So Thanks. it is okay. So I'll put it to rest. It's no longer <clears throat> UFOs that caused this. All right. We are learning. All right, Lauren, um, is it too late for hollyhocks to have hollyhock rust? And if and, and what do you do about it if they if they do have that? So that right now is definitely a time you'd see hollyhock rust, and that would be any any of the the small spots that you'd see on the leaves that would have kind of raised areas, the pustules that produce spores. Uh, once it, it you have a lot of it, it can be really difficult to control. So I you know I hate to recommend fungicides in a situation where you have a lot of a lot of rust, um, but you you can use them. A lot of different products. Any of the general use fungicides would work. Uh, propiconazole and mycobutanil would be the products of choice that that I would suggest. Uh, and then look at having that controlled next year earlier. That's All right. the other thing. Thanks, Lauren. Sarah, you get an image. Uh, this is a viewer who sent in this picture from Cozad and wants this beastie identified. And this one, it, mm. uh, I'm sorry, that we got the corn first. My okay. mistake. So we have a viewer who sent in pictures of corn that we don't have a husk 
and yeah. they're wondering why. And then we have a second set that has corn with tassels and no ears whatsoever. So right. what's going on with these? You know, um, this, this really isn't all that uncommon, but it's really uh, kind of fun when a gardener sees this in their corn patch because usually it's, it's, it's uh, new to them. But um, corn plants are male and female. They have the male part, which is the tassel at the top, and then they have the female part, which is the ear with the silks. But when corn plants are young, the female and male flowers are actually perfect, which means they, the male tassel has both female and male parts, and the, the ears that have both male and female parts. Well, there are some environmental conditions, and we don't really know exactly what it is, that will allow the tassel portion of the corn to retain the female parts. And so the tassel then can start to actually develop kernels on it, like you would see on a regular corn ear. And the same thing can happen on the female portion, uh, you know, where the silks, uh, obviously, you know, there would be an ear there, um, and, and, and you'll have uh, corn kernels without a husk on them. So it's, um, it's, it's a physiological thing. It's, used, it's probably environmental. It's almost always seen on tillers, which are not the main stalk of the corn, but the secondary stalks that come out from the base. Um, and it doesn't really affect production of the corn, so it, it pr hasn't been studied a lot uh, by agronomists because it doesn't affect you know, productivity. Uh, but it's really just kind of an oddity. So it's, you know, it's perfect flowers occurring where they normally don't occur, allowing kernel development. All right, uh, Jim, you get a picture. This is a Ewing, Nebraska viewer who sent in a cucumber leaf uh, covered with quite a bit of black stuff. Mm -hmm. They wonder if they're aphid eggs. She said there were some green aphids and she sprayed them with eight. She did, okay. Um, the picture looks like those are what we would call cotton slash melon aphids because they feed on a wide host range of plants. And uh, boy, they, uh, that's the worst I've ever seen as far as numbers go. Or maybe I should say, wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> but, but those kinds of situations do develop, especially in protected areas. And uh, there's no disturbance and that kind of thing. And the populations of the aphids develop fairly quickly. I would suggest that those, those leaves could simply be trimmed off and disposed of as a means of helping to manage the numbers. Eventually, the natural enemies like the lady beetles and the green lace wings will just home right in on a big population like that, and they'll take their part of it too. So that's, that's great. Um, if it's necessary to treat, then again, the insecticidal soaps would be valuable, especially applied in the morning. But mostly just removing the leaves would be fine. Excellent. Thank you. All right, Zach, this is a viewer who has violets in their garden. They're spreading, choking out other plants. She likes them in some locations, but needs to do something about the spread. So, yeah, so she selectively just wants to take them out of certain areas. Right. So, uh, the best, the, the, probably the safest way to take them out of surface, uh, certain areas is to either to dig them out or hoe them out. Uh, the problem with violets is that they have a rootstock, and so when you dig or hoe, you have a chance of leaving all or part of that rootstock behind, so you it may or may not be successful. Uh, again, that's a broadleaf herbicide if you want to spray that in the fall, but again, you have to be really careful because you don't want to get your other perennial ornamentals uh, in there, so hoe it, dig it, spray it. Enjoy it. Or enjoy it. That would, you know, violets, you know, I, I, let, the, let, your, let your conscience be your guide. Sometimes violets are very pretty. They support a lot of butterflies. It's, you know, again, it's, and they're hard to control, so sometimes just give it up and give it up. go with the violets, and many parts are edible. Okay, exact. <laughs> All right, Lauren, you get a picture. Uh, this is a viewer who has a pear tree, lots of fruit. Most of them have black splots or splots or spotches, <laughs> one way or the other. They wants to, he wants to press them for cider or wine and wants mm -hmm. to know what this infection is. Actually gave a name here, uh, Venturia perina. Yeah. Um, and, and actually, on, we'll see this on pears and, and apples as well. Uh, and this is a sooty blotch, which is a surface growing fungus. We also see another one called fly speck, which is more concentrated. Uh, but both of them just, just fungal surface growing organisms. Uh, if you wash the fruit off, there's never been a, an indication that there was anything you know, that would be hazardous to use it. So uh, I would just wash it off uh, and, and, and use the fruit as you normally would. Uh, right. You can try to manage it, but it is a really difficult one to manage. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. I'd treat it like violets. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
got that. <laughs> Sarah, you got a question from our audience. Uh, this is a viewer who wants to know what the little tree-like weeds are that seem to be popping up everywhere in the lawn this year, and why are there so many of them? So baby trees in the lawn. Well, yeah, you know, a lot of trees do seed themselves in the lawn. Um, I get cherry, cherry tree seedlings in my lawn all the time from my neighbor's cherry tree, and uh, maples will seed themselves very easily. Oaks will seed themselves. The squirrels love to plant the oaks in the, in the lawn, and then here they'll come up the next year. So, um, you know, if there's not too many of them, what I like to do is just wait till after we've had a rain and the soil is rather um, uh, soft. And then you can usually pull them if they're, if they're still fairly small. If they're, you know, maybe six inches or so tall, then you can usually hand pull them. Once they get beyond that point, then sometimes it gets a little tougher. You might not be able to pull them. You might have to prune them down and then do a little bit of a stump treatment with a little bit of herbicide to keep them from growing back. Um, but I find that just, you know, hand pulling them as I, as I spot them is, is a good enough control. Or mow. You could mow. Yeah, you can, you yeah. can mow, they, they, yeah. won't, they won't take mowing, and as a guy, I like to use mowers and equipment and machines <laughs> yeah. and mow it. The bigger the mower, the better. Well, my problem is I mow them, but then they keep coming back. Mow it again. So, <laughs> so keep day. mowing. Okay, every other day. Yeah. Okay, Jim, you got a question, which is, again, that they've, they found the empty carcass of an insect. Do you think that's still the cicada and this is on lindens is that what yeah I really do you know here? the basswood or linden seems like they actually support um, cicadas I was underneath a tree today I could not believe how many spent shells there were so yeah they're just empty shells you know great thing to pick up and look at and scare the girls with or whatever <laughs> but uh, other than that that's it okay thanks <laughs> uh, Zach you get a picture which is, uh, it's been coming up for three years now. She didn't plant it. It's really pretty. The flowers turn into green berries that turn black. The birds like them, and uh, nothing else seems to hurt it. There's, there are now more of them. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's pokeweed, mm -hmm. and... It's perennial. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> if she likes it, more power to her. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think is poke. I don't think pokeweed is, is poisonous. It is. I think it is poisonous. poisonous. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, the but, berries. But not to the birds. The birds love yeah. the berries. So right. Yeah. Right. Just don't eat it. Enjoy it. Yeah. Okay. All right, uh, Lauren. You have an audience question, which is uh, black-eyed Susans or Rudbeckia has the brown blackish spots on the foliage and then the leaves curl up. Sometimes it happens to zinnias as well, which are same family. Okay. Yeah, and, and in Rutabecchia, a lot of times we see it, there's a septoria leaf spot that will happen many times, you know, this time of year, maybe a little bit earlier. So a few things you can do is, you know, try to remove uh, the, you've got leaves that are really affected a lot. You can remove some of those, avoid overhead irrigation. That's probably the main thing. Um, the general purpose, you know, broad spectrum ornamental fungicides you can use, but uh, it usually doesn't kill the plant. So if you want to keep it really green, you may have to go to that, but in general, it's not going to kill it. All right, excellent, thanks. Sarah, you have uh, a picture next. So this is a question from a viewer who wants to know, and this is from Cozad, mm -hmm. what is this? Yeah, <laughs> you know, I had never seen this plant before either, so I had to get a little help from my friends, but this is a plant called Devil's Claw, and it, it, the, the seed pod is long and curved shape. It almost looks like a, what you might imagine a nail off of a dinosaur looking like. It's, it's a really claw-like seed pod. And um, uh, it's native actually in North America, more down in the southwest area in um, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, northern, northern Mexico. Um, and um, it is a weed in this area, but... Um, Native Americans used to eat the seeds. They eat, ate them kind of like pine nuts. And uh, there are some Native American tribes that still use the fibers in the pods uh, for weaving purposes. So just a little bit of trivia about this plant, but it would be considered a weed. Mm -hmm. Many of our most interesting plants are, yeah. actually. <laughs> All right, Jim, you get a question, and this is actually a sample and an email question, and it has to do with what is eating the petunias <coughs> right now. Okay, uh, through the season with petunias, you can have several generations of what's called a tobacco budworm, and when they first hatch, the moths lay the eggs at nighttime on the leaves, and then when they first hatch, the tiny little caterpillars feed, make little etchings and holes in the leaves, but they're as big as a corn earworm when they're larger, 
And when they're larger, they, they move into the blossoms and feed in the blossoms. And they actually kind of turn the same color as the blossoms, so you can't really see them that well. So pick them off as you see them. That's one possibility. The other one are the cucumber beetles. Like we have this black cucumber beetle that's been around this year more so, the spotted cucumber beetles, and even the northern corn rootworm, which is a relative, it's just plain uh, bright green. And they love to feed on succulent, tender, new growth and flowers. And they're very difficult to control because there's so many of them when they move into an area. So it's just one of those realities that we have to deal with. All right, thank you, Jim. Okay, here's a good one, Zach. This is an Omaha viewer who has nut sedge. They've treated before June 21st, still exists. They've read it thrives in clay soil, poor <laughs> drainage. They want to improve the clay in the lawn rather to get rid of the nut sedge rather than try to figure out how to kill it, till it, or will it away. Yeah, that, uh, that's pro actually improving the clay soil is virtually impossible, <laughs> but it's easier to do that than control yellow nut sedge. <laughs> uh, it's a, 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 yellow nut sedge has a really complex life cycle. Uh, I know Rock has said many times, spray it before the longest day of the year, and that's probably a good one, a good recommendation, but multiple applications are gonna be needed. And there's so many tubers in the soil, it just takes a long time to control that to make a, a big dent in that. We do have a bunch of research projects on that. Uh, in terms of, of improving a clay soil, the best way to improve a clay soil is start over, kill the soil or kill the grass if it's a, if it's a turf, kill the grass, uh, incorporate uh, compost. I normally, we normally say uh, two inches of compost tilled in one inch at a time in different directions is your best, best bet. It's difficult, it's hard to overcome that. Do not try to till in so sand, that will never work. Compost is your best bet. Excellent. And then aerify, aerify, aerify forever. Excellent. Thank Sounds you, like Zach. they should treat it like violets. Is that same? <laughs> yeah, or you can move. Yeah, that's another one you okay. can move. Or, or ro I don't know. Move. I don't think you can rogue out you rogue clay. It, yeah. Yeah. You could try. It's going to be mm -hmm. hard. It's going to be hard. Yeah. Big equipment though. Yeah. Big, big equipment. Engines. Okay. All right, gentlemen. Stop it. Stop. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, Lauren. This is a viewer who says every year their acorn squash gets powdery mildew mm -hmm. on the foliage. What what can they do about that, or is it an issue? Well, you, you're going to see powdery mildew on, on most of the cucurbits on the squash, so it, you can uh, try to manage that. <laughs> One thing with powdery mildew is it is not favored by that wetness on the leaf surface, so overhead irrigation sometimes actually reduces powdery mildew, which is mm -hmm. counterintuitive to most of our fungal diseases. So if that's your main problem, that's what I would do. I would overhead irrigate. Um, that said, you still may have problems and you could look at a fungicide. I just, I hate to recommend fungicides in backyard gardens because for the most part you can get by and still have production and not do that. So Excellent. try overhead irrigating if that's your only problem. All right, thanks Lauren. Sarah from Bellevue, this is a viewer who has an eight foot plum that's top heavy and, and wants to know whether they should trim the branches or will that upset the natural balance of the tree? And, and if so, when to prune? Well, if it's top heavy because it has a really heavy fruit load, then what the, the viewer might want to think about next year is thinning the fruits. You know, oftentimes fruit trees will set way more fruits than they can actually develop well. And so you'll end up with really small fruits or in some, time, in some cases you'll actually um, have damage to the tree where a branch will break out of the tree because it has too much fruit load. So thinning the fruits would be really something to think about. And with plums, you would want to leave about like maybe one plum for every six inches of branch. And you know, again, fruit trees will often set way more fruit than that in the springtime. Um, the other thing, if, if this tree hasn't been pruned properly over its life and it has you know, maybe a skinny trunk and, and maybe not a balanced canopy, then I would look at doing that pruning um, the very best time of year would be in late winter, so February, March, um, and you would be not pruning a lot of little cuts, but you would be selectively maybe removing some branches so that you could restructure the shape of that tree so that it wouldn't be quite so top heavy. Um, so I think that's, that's how I would go about it, Kim. All right, thanks, Sarah. Jim, we have um, chigger frustration again and again. Anything people can do short of staying in the great indoors? Yeah, mainly, you know, wear the creams or the sprays, you know, to help repel the, the chiggers. Um, if, you wear, if you wear shoes and socks and pants, they often will 
crawl up there and get in those tight places and then they'll settle in and, and do their biting. So it's really tough. Keep, stay out of tall grasses um, because they often are hanging on the foliage. And so that's just the main, main precautions. If it ha after the fact, you know, you have your comfort with some of these salves and creams that contain cortisone and anti-itching, anti-histamine types of uh, products. And uh, chiggers usually occur from late June all the way till when we start to get really chilly, dry weather. And that won't be for another few more weeks. And then you can just change your habit and go out and enjoy the landscape, barbecue or whatever. All right, thanks, Jim. And stay out of long grass. Yes. Okay, Zach, we have a, a, about a minute left. This is a viewer who has a nice old zoysia lawn, uh, full sun, and wants to keep it, but has Creeping Charlie in it. How does she get rid of the Creeping Charlie or he without getting rid of the zoysia? Uh, uh, yeah, Creeping Charlie, again, we talked about it earlier, it's the same as ground ivy, and the best way to control that is wait until the zoysia goes uh, dormant in the fall, and you can spray it with either Roundup, and that will control the ground ivy, but it will not control the dormant zoysia. Uh, more likely, I would probably use a three-way herbicide and spray that in the fall. Again, I would wait, you have to probably wait until after the zoysia goes dormant, so sometime October, and even as late as November, will be more than acceptable. All right, thank you, Zach. In, in 10 seconds or less, Lauren, what should they do about fungus in the lawn? <laughs> 10 seconds or less, move. <laughs> <laughs> or give it up. Identify the problem and then let's talk about management after that. All right, and Sarah, we are almost out of time. Is there any way, I did that on purpose. Is there any <laughs> what means of controlling the pods that uh, off a seedless locust? So in other words, the seedless locust isn't. Um, no, there, well, there, there are some things you can spray on the tree when it's blooming um, to try to eliminate that. that, but it's very difficult to spray a, a large mature tree. So unfortunately, I think the short answer is no, you're just gonna have to tolerate it.